Sparrow Town Council, July 17th meeting to order. Welcome. Um, first thing to do is a Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tony, roll call. Councilor Cloutier? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor uh, Donovan? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Hayes? Here. Good evening. Um, the next item on the agenda is general public comments, but we do have a special guest tonight. So, Sean, I don't know if you would like to come up and join us. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Shall I start by reading it? Sure, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, it's short and sweet. Representative Babine started his public service to Scarborough 20 years ago when he was elected to the school board in 1999. He joined the town council for the first time in 2002 and has served as a town councilor for 12 of the past 17 years. Sean has served in both the town council vice chair and town council chair roles and has lent his financial background and expertise to the finance committee for the past five years. On behalf of the town of Scarborough, I want to thank you for your commitment to the town and for your countless hours of service over two decades of time. I don't know if any, any councillors would like to... At this point in time, if anybody wants to say anything, I don't know, to our colleague and peer, or... Yeah, I'd love to speak um, uh, to this. Sean has been one of the most committed, dedicated town servants that we have ever had. Uh, he has run, been tireless and repeatedly running. He's carried uh, the community's responsibilities and the finance committee on repeated occasions, which is the hardest job uh, that the town council has. Uh, and uh, he uh, is very deserving of this commendation and recognition. Anybody else? I'll chime in. I, I know, Sean, you and I have served on the Finance Committee for many, many years. Thanks for the guidance. And I thank you, especially this year, to come back as chair when you're trying to juggle all the other things. So thanks for all your, all your time and effort for us. Thank you. I, I'm very curious how you survived 12 years because uh, I barely uh, got my head above water in year three. So um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, something to be commended for and, and your services duly noted and thank you. Yeah, I, you know, Sean, we didn't serve a ton of time together, but for the little time we did, I thought you were the utmost professional and you're incredibly principled and I, and I always respected the fact that you, you spoke to your principles and uh, agree or disagree, I, I give you 100% credit for that. So, yeah. yeah, as uh, the new guy here, we didn't get to serve, but uh, you, you did show some encouragement when I was uh, considering running, and I appreciate that, and uh, you know, we became friends uh, on Facebook at, at a minimum. I have trouble keeping up with your posts, let alone all of the organizations that you're uh, extremely involved in, not just like participating in, but really leading all the travels that you do, and you continue to do for um, the residents of Scarborough at the State House. So thank you for your service. Yeah, I'd like to um, add to all the comments. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect in terms of uh, my first year in the council, first couple of months in the council, working with Sean, you know, uh, acknowledging that we probably had different views and a lot of things. But I uh, grew in a short period of time to really respect him in terms of uh, him living up to his commitments uh, to the council and setting a great example in terms of uh, you know how to deal with tough issues uh, with a diversity of opinion and he was always very respectful and encouraging and uh, it's one of those occasions where uh, you know you get surprised by the outcome you know I I, I uh, liked him a lot better than I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> Give me time. <laughs> So again, thank you, Sean. And I think with that, as we move to the next agenda on public comments, Sean also wanted to just kind of update us on some of the things that are happening in, in Augusta and whatever else you'd like to share with us tonight. Um, so if I can actually talk to the, uh, uh, the honor that I have tonight in receiving this. Um, this is the first time in 20 years I've actually spoken on the side of the uh, hmm? podium, so I'm a little nervous, believe it or not. Um, and at the same time, very humble. 
Um, over the last 20 years, I've uh, served with, I actually figured it out, 27 different town councilors, wow. 31 different uh, school board members, because I do consider them co-equals, five superintendents, and three town managers, and only one town clerk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all of the people that I've served with because it's an extreme honor. Um, service has always been about um, um, finding the time and responsibility to do what is necessary to make a town a little better. I grew up with a stepfather who was an extreme influence in my life, um, who was a road manager. Um, I'm sorry, he was the, uh, what's it called? Uh, commissioner. Road commissioner. He was road commissioner for 50 years in our hometown. And so I grew up with that kind of commitment in the background, and I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, and um, especially, Tody, um, you've been an incredible person uh, for me personally. Um, and I really want to say thank you. What people don't really realize, and I've always said thank you to the others, um, it's not about um, us who serve in that seat, um, no, no matter what board it is, including the sanitary district. It's about the partners we have in our life who let us do that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my wife, Terry, is here tonight. I've got to say thank you because it has been an incredible journey and if it wasn't for her, uh, back in the day before email and before social media, um, there's always the good old telephone call um, that we would get at 11 o'clock at night and a lot of uh, citizens would call that late um, and yell and scream and um, um, she would try to be polite as much as possible and say, but he's still at the town council meeting. Believe it or not, back in those days, we would still be in a town council meeting at 11, 12 o'clock at night. And she's like, turn on the TV and you'll see he's still there. You can't take the phone call. Um, but you learn over the years. And I just want to say thank you to her and to my daughter, Olivia. Olivia was six years old when I first started. Um, she's 26 now and actually a legislative aide in Congress. So she uh, definitely um, got something from the family tree. She's on the other side of the aisle, which we won't talk about, but I'm uh, so <laughs> extremely proud. Extremely proud. And uh, I, I want to say thank you to all of you um, for that. Um, and um, as far as, uh, enough of that, you know, um, um, I, I've got to say that in our first year, um, and I do, I actually did have a chance to talk to uh, Representative Chiazzo. He sends his best wishes as well and what we wanted to give as an update. And we've got the, the we have to at least say that we're extremely pleased with the work that has been done this past year with the help of a different governor um, and the accomplishments that we've had. And we think that our promises have been kept. Medicaid expansion um, has gone through. $126 million in new educational funding was part of the um, governor's budget. Uh, main revenue sharing, which is the most significant piece for Scarborough, since we are a um, uh, a minimal receiver on the educational side, so no matter how much they put it into the formula, Scarborough won't receive any more. Um, um, it's extremely important. We didn't get to the 5% that is statutorily required, but the 3.5% was an extreme, um, a big jump over the original proposal. In fact, um, what we estimated for the town of Scarborough was about 512000 additional dollars over the prior year. Um, in addition to that, our work, um, Representative Chiazzo's work on the EUT, or the energy, utilities, and technology uh, has really focused on the impact of central main power uh, to the entire state, um, as well as broadband, which is part of the economic strategy that I'm looking at as part of um, the IDEA committee. Although I, I actually joke and call it IKEA, which is I know everything already. Um, <laughs> it's a nice chuckle, but um, IDEA is really talking about economic development and how we can transform that, and broadband is a big, big part of that, because people don't realize that while rural Maine has very little. Um, Southern Maine, like Scarborough, is very challenged. Um, if not, pick up your cell phone and just simply try to call some night when you're on the coast uh, because it's extremely challenging. So um, a lot of that has happened. The bigger piece that both Chris and I actually champion together that impacts um, the, the region, because we are talking, um, we do try to look at regional solutions that you should be aware of, and I know um, Councillor Hamill is probably aware of this from Eagle Maine, is that Chris and I champion um, a bill that actually um, allowed uh, solid waste management to be included with the RPS bill that was proposed um, by the governor and the energy office um, that really um, allows us to address the deficiencies within the bill and state statute um, regarding solid waste management. Um, and that in itself could lead to anywhere from $250,000 to $500,000 uh, for a regional solution. Scarborough's portion is 
based upon its percentage of ownership in the domain, but it's a significant, significant uh, win for us in the sense that um, it addresses the shortfall that the recycling market has had um, on our community and um, all of our partners, which are, um, you know, just about everyone around Scarborough, um, you know, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and, and Gorham, and some of the others. Um, and so that has been a, a, a big part of our effort. Um, I, if I remember looking at the numbers correctly, uh, both of us took an approach that we wanted to uh, at least sponsor one bill and make that our focus and then look at our partnerships and where we can develop relationships with others through that advocacy. And I think we were very successful. Uh, Chris uh, sponsored approximately 40 to 50 uh, different bills in addition to his one. I did the same. Um, and focusing on different portfolio interests, uh, ranging from uh, uh, women's access to health care to um, uh, changes to um, Mubeck, which is the um, uh, municipal, uh, municipal codes uh, for our code enforcement and other pieces. And so uh, it's been a lot of work and we love it. I will tell you, I apologize for not being here earlier. Um, the last meeting in June, which I was planning on being here, was an all-nighter at the State House. It was an interesting experience. Um, and all I gotta say is that uh, if you can imagine uh, what it's like, um, it's the scene from the Animal House movie in which John Belushi come down, comes downstairs and takes the um, guitar away from the, whoever's playing it and wants to smash it. He smashes it again because they were, they had guitars and they were singing. And I'm like, oh my god! But, um, but it's part of the experience, and you have to smile and you have to laugh. But um, that all comes um, in due time with the hard work that we had. And um, I really want to say uh, thank you to Scarborough for the time that I've been able to serve and the time that I'm able to serve now in the state legislature. And I do want to mention um, Chris and I have really uh, uh, focused on uh, what I'll call a. Uh, um, a dual relationship in Scarborough from, as a representative, uh, as representatives, and that is that no matter where you live in Scarborough, while Route 1 kind of splits our districts, um, we try to provide the same attention, whether you call me and you live on West Scarborough uh, Road or you know, wherever you live, the same thing for Chris. Um, we're here for Scarborough as a whole. It doesn't matter that, that boundary, and uh, we hope that everyone takes an opportunity to come visit us. It is the people's house. Um, and we honor that uh, very distinctly. And I want to make a, a promise, because um, over the last 20 years, I've seen a lot of legislators, and I remember Carol Cloud and Glennis Lovett and some um, great people that have served, no matter what their party is. And the one thing um, that both Chris and I want to bring back is that we promise to you as our colleagues that you are equal. Uh, we want to share that stage with you as well as with the school board. Um, we will not interfere in local politics. Um, however, if you ask our advice on how it applies or impacts our state, we will be happy to give that to you personally. Um, but we want to make sure that uh, you understand that our door is always open as legislators. And um, I just want to say thank you. I'm really glad, by the way, that the three-minute clock is not going to be But But in the end, um, we really want to say thank you. And uh, we have a, a very... Uh, joint promise to you and a commitment um, that um, uh, we want to do what is best for Scarborough as a whole. I will leave you with one piece of personal advice as a legislator, but also as a former councilman. You know, um, we talk about revenue sharing, we talk about a lot of formulas and a lot of things that happen at the state level. Um, I would strongly recommend to the council if you could look at the contract zone that is with um, the uh, Scarborough Downs, um, the former Scarborough Downs, or the Downs. Because one of the things when we talk about revenue sharing that impacts the formula and what you receive is the total valuation. And what you put into a, um, um, what's the word, uh, you put into a reserve or that you protect um, makes a significant difference. And as we have a new commitment to providing that reimbursement through um, reserves, uh, the, more, uh, the more valuation that you can shelter will lead to more money that you can receive. Because you're not going to receive it on educational funding. You will receive it on the revenue sharing. And so um, you're at the early stages, but once that takes off, um, the more you shelter, the better off Scarborough will be long term, well after all of you have served. Mm -hmm. It'll be one of the best policies that I think that you have done. Um, and I um, hopefully will have advocated as a legislator. So uh, please take that into consideration. But um, in the end, I just want to say thank you 
can't look at her, so I'll cry. <laughs> thank, thank you, Terry, very thank much you, Terry. for what she's allowed me to do. So, thank you. No, thank you. And with that, that kind of opens up to public comment. Just one housekeeping item. I think when we did a roll call, Jean Marie's on vacation, I understand, so she's not here yes. this evening, just so the minutes reflect that. Mm -hmm. And she let us know she wasn't going to be here this evening as she's, she's away, right? Or she's silent? Island or? hopping? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So just the minutes to reflect that. So for public comment, anybody that wants to speak to anything that's not on the agenda this evening, they're welcome to come forward and give us some public comment if they'd like. Um, would anybody like to have public comment at this point? Seeing none, we'll close that up. Item six on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. We don't have any this evening, or oh, the minutes. Uh, excuse me. So the item five is the uh, motion to approve the minutes from the June nineteenth meeting. So moved. Second. Is, is there any discussion, comments, edits? With that, all those in favor of approving the minutes? Thank you. It's unanimous. Um, Item six is adjustment to the agenda. There are none tonight. Item seven are items to be signed, treasurer's warrants. I have done that. Um, then the first order of business is order number 19041, which is a public hearing and second reading on their proposed changes to chapter 405, town of Scarborough zoning, zoning ordinance section six. And with that, um, I'll turn it to Larissa, who is also Tom Hall, is on vacation this week with family in the Cape, I believe. So Larissa is going to guide us through the process tonight and get us out of here an hour, she has said. So. Oh, no, Tody has said that. Oh, well, Tody has said that. Okay. And we do not contradict the we'll town clerk ever. <laughs> we'll um, I'm going to go ahead and actually toss this over to Bill as the liaison to that um, Affordable Housing Committee, if that's okay with you, Bill. Certainly. Speak to that. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, Housing Alliance uh, identified an issue with, uh, uh, with how uh, uh, its uh, housing uh, was defined. It was determined that we needed a small <coughs> word change to go from two units to one unit. It's a technical change. Uh, and this is second reading, I believe. Yeah. So, thank you. So with that, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve this? So moved. So moved. Any discussion, questions? Second. 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 Oh, second. <laughs> second. <laughs> any, any discussion, comments? Oh, all those in favor? See you next. Um, the next item on the agenda is number 19049, public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302, Scarborough Town Council Rules and Procedures, Section 300, Subsection 304. And again, with that, Larissa, you want to? Sure. Uh, so this it? is coming to you from your Rules and Policies Committee. Um, they workshopped this language over a few months' worth of meetings. And it, um, Bill, would you like to speak to this? Sure. Uh, uh, Councilor Katerina uh, uh, wished to speak to the legislator, legislature, uh, at a hearing some several months ago. Uh, and we had a discussion uh, at that time that determined that it would be appropriate to have a policy for how this would be handled. The uh, Rules and Policies Committee looked at it and uh, uh, created a relatively simple policy. Uh, proposal, which is, and I'll read it, it's section 304, Town Council policy on publicly speaking as a representative of the Town Council as a body. Councilors wishing to speak on behalf of the Town Council or as a representative of the Town Council as a body shall present a resolution expressing the content of any public statement to the Council for adoption by a vote of five of its members. And the, the discussion at length was regarding what vote that needed to be taken by. The um, Rules and Policies Committee, after a couple of months, kind of going back and forth, voted unanimously to not hold a standard of unanimity in that vote and to go with a what they defined in their meetings as a supermajority. The language of a vote of five of its members is to be consistent with other town council policies that require that same sort of supermajority as opposed to a simple majority. And again, with that, is there any public comment on this order, this issue? Seeing none, I close public comment. Motion to approve. So moved. Jaga. Any discussion, questions? Seeing none. Bill, no, it's a pretty straightforward matter, and it's just a, it's a simple process for allowing uh, any counselor to put on an agenda a draft resolution 
that could be considered, and uh, it, it just formalizes a process that needed to be formalized. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would, I would just add that there was, it was a great discussion, and I think, in this because this has come up two or three yeah. times in my three-year tenure, and this gives people a real clear guideline around how to go about get, about doing that. And, and I had the opportunity to sit in on uh, part of the discussion around this, and I want to uh, say hats off to the uh, to the Rules and Policy Committee for their ability to come up with a, you know, economical and very clear uh, wording for something that was not really uh, uncomplicated. Anybody else? If not, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Unanimous. Um, then it, old business is 19050. Um, second reading on the request to approve the expenditure in the amount not to exceed $90,721 from the Land Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purpose of purchasing a portion of the Blue Point Congregational Church property. And again with that, Larissa? Again. Sure. So this is coming back to you. It was discussed by this council at the last meeting in June and had uh, unanimous support by the councils of others present in that first reading. So this is just coming back to you for your second um, reading and action on this item. Thank you. Um, again, on this item, is there anybody that would like to speak to this in public comment? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Would someone like to make a motion to approve this? So moved. Second. Any discussion, questions, comments, by the way? Councilor Fuller? I did threaten to vote against it because my sister didn't show up this evening to speak. Um, <laughs> however, I'm happy to support it. I think it's, uh, uh, it was great work uh, done by everyone involved, and um, happy to support it. Anyone else? Good job by the Scarborough Land Trust to work through some of the issues that were involved with neighboring properties and I have to really applaud them for their dedication and commitment to uh, preserving Scarborough land. And this is uh, one of the first times we've gotten a piece of land in the Scarborough Marsh mm -hmm. near, uh, 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 not Pleasant Hill, near uh, Pine Point. Pine Point yeah. uh, so I uh, fully support it. Beautiful piece of property. Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I think it's an exciting acquisition. I look forward to using it. And just wanted to remind everybody that this depletes the account for or the referendum bond that had been allocated towards land acquisition. So that's something that we need to keep an eye on if, if, if it's something that we want to put um, in front of the voters again. Good point. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, the next order for new business is number 19052, act to adopt the fiscal year 2020 school budget resolutions as required by the state statute. And again, yes, Larissa. back to me. Uh, yeah. So this is just the final step in the school budget process. You do this each year as kind of a um, codification of the vote that the people took back in June. And again, any anybody from the audience like to speak to this? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Um, would someone like to make, make a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Um, any discussion, comment? No, I think it's pretty straightforward. So all those in favor? It's unanimous. The next order is order number 19053, act on request of the posting and action of the names to the various committee board as recommended by the, the Appointments and Negotiating Committee, and I, and I think Negotiations Committee, and I think Larissa, again, if you want to. And, uh, no, I think actually I'm going to toss this right back to you as the council chair that makes this official nomination for these um, posts. We've got someone for the Coastal Waters and Harbor, Liam Erickson, the full voting member with a term to expire 2020. Oh. No. <laughs> Tony's Don. whispering something to me. I know, it was what? actually Don's chair, so I think Don. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> sorry, Don. It's okay. <laughs> Continuing along, uh, <laughs> three, uh, three recommendations for appointment uh, for approval by the council. Uh, Liam Erickson is a full voting member with term to expire in 2020 uh, to the Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee. Uh, Denise Smith as the first alternate with a term to expire in 2020 to the Senior Advisory Board, and finally Jennifer Waters as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2020 uh, to the ZBA, Zoning Board of Appeals. So with that, um, is there any public comment on these proposed appointments? Seeing none, I'll close that. Um, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Is there any comments, discussion, additional conversations? Seeing none, all those in favor? 
That's unanimous. Um, the next item on the agenda, um, this might take a little bit of explanation, but it's order number 19054. It's act on the council chairs committee board appointments, which this would be the one that I was this, about, this yeah, been, this this been, been been talking about. Um, and we're going to make a slight change to that, and I'll explain a little bit. We did get some questions from a fellow council, Council Clear, that actually asked some great questions about our process and how we do things. I, I think they were great questions. What we have had some discussions, what we've talked about doing is between now and when we do the next committee assignments, which will be after the fall elections, to have this go back to roles and policy, just to look at our processes and to answer some of the questions, get a legal opinion about what we should be doing, how we should be doing. There are some very good questions asked, so it's great for us to re-examine the process, so we'll do that. And I think tonight there's a motion to maybe amend the, the, the main amendment, so as, as we go through this, I think that's the introduction. Um, is there any public comment on this issue? So I think what we need to do is make a motion to approve the original motion, then, uh, then vote. So moved. Amendment. Second. Any discussion and comment on the original? So I, I can try to elaborate uh, sure. yeah, a yeah. little on yeah, what I saw. I, I'm the new guy, uh, so going through it for the first time, I, I might look at things or see things that raise questions because I haven't done this yeah. um, for yeah. 10 years. And, Fresh um, pairs of eyes, always yeah, good. Exactly. So I was reading through our um, rules and procedures and uh, noticed uh, some guidance that was listed there for um, uh, committee selections and assignments and uh, the description or discrepancy that I saw that uh, has been a standard practice for us that, uh, over I think a decade uh, is, is what I heard um, was that uh, the way the rules read uh, could be interpreted that the chair is automatically an ex officio member of every committee and when we list the chair as an individual or regular member of a committee that creates a duality or a conflict um, or it confused me, is it, it, basically, so that's why I asked the question. I don't have an answer for what the right way is, and I think the recommendation to send it to committee and seek guidance on it um, is, is good, both in terms of how it reads and, and, um, and then clarify how it reads so that it either conforms to what our practices are today or what we want them to be. So that, that's all. So thank you. Sure. I'm glad I could create some excitement this week. That's true. That's true. <laughs> It was a slow week, yeah, it was, it was all good. Um, so with that, the, the original order, um, there was a request to kind of change how we, how we did that to, uh, to officially name all the members of the committees as kind of being ratified tonight as they exist to, to go. So that would be the amendment. I don't know if you want to introduce that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to introduce that uh, amendment to the main motion then, if I may, uh, which reads as follows. Move approval of the following council chair committee and board appointments. Finance Committee, Councillor Hamill as Chair, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Hayes, and Communications Committee, Councillor Foley as Chair, Councillor Cloutier, Councillor Hamill. Is there a motion to? So moved. Second. Any discussion and comment? To all those, yes, Councillor? Uh, just thanks to those, you know, we have new members who are offering to take on more responsibility. I think that's great, Don, offering to be chair for the balance of the year uh, for the Finance Committee, which is always a heavy lift. And uh, I, I really applaud your willingness to serve, so thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Jones? I just, I actually want to thank uh, Councilor Clear to br actually bringing up, I thought he had some great observations about the language. We went back and forth over email a couple of times, but I, there is a little nuance there that I think is worth exploring, and I'm glad that somebody flagged it, and I think this is a great opportunity to, to bring it back to rules and policy. Uh, and I'm going to miss my communication committee, uh, but besides that, uh, thank you, John. I thought it was a good conversation so far, and I'm, I'm intrigued on what the end result will be for, so, for us. So. So with that, is there a motion, is there a vote for any other comments on the motion to amend? No? If not, all those in favor of that's unanimous. Now we're back to the main motion as amended. Um, any discussion on that? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> 
The last item on the agenda is 19055. It's act on the recommendation of the Scarborough Housing Alliance to utilize funds from the Affordable Housing Initiative Fund in the amount of 300000 toward the Bessie Commons 2 project and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents related to this order. And I will turn to Larissa once again, and okay. I think we'll have some others that will fill in some of the information. Yep, I was going to say, I'm certainly happy to turn this over to Bill as the chair of the, uh, of the liaison, rather, to the Scarborough Housing Alliance. I also want to acknowledge that Marge DeSanctis, who I believe is chair of that um, committee, is also here. So, Bill, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Uh, uh, this is a matter that's been before uh, the Housing Alliance. Uh, uh, Marge DeSantis is the chair of Housing Alliance and is here with us tonight. And I'd ask Marge to go up and present to us what is before us. And, and just a point, I think I think there was, we did get a letter with some questions that came yes. us from a constituent, but I think you're, you've I'm, I'm graciously, prepared. you're prepared to kind of <coughs> address so, some um, of those things, so First, thank you. I want to go back a year, and um, Bessie Commons 2 uh, was proposed for state funding last year and the town authorized uh, or through the housing alliance the town authorized one hundred thousand towards Betsy Commons to last year which would give them one extra point in the state um, main state housing rulings but they did, were not able to get funding. So one thing I want to point out is we do want to ask for an additional three hundred thousand which would make the total four hundred thousand for a forty unit project of all affordable housing. And not only do they meet the standard of uh, affordable being 80% of AMI, which is the area median income, but Bessie Commons too is actually going to achieve 60% of AMI on average. Some might be 50 or 70, but it's on average going to be 60%. So 40 units uh, for 400,000 is only 10,000 per unit, which is well below what we put in our RFP. When we first prepared our RFP, geez, two, three years ago, whenever it was, um, we had put a cap of 20,000 per unit. So to be able to get 40 units uh, all at once um, for a 10,000 per unit um, contribution is actually, um, I guess, the best bang for the buck is what I'll say. <coughs> most, most developers, and this was somewhat of the questions in, that were posed by um, public. So most developers do not want to build affordable housing. Their requirement is 10%. So um, so they might, if they only did 10 houses, they'd only have to do one affordable. And it's easier to pay the in lieu fee. How, which is why we altogether have gotten over a million dollars in this in this initiative, is because everybody pays the in lieu fee. Um, or they don't want to put affordable like a gateway, they were doing um, a high-end apartments. So they didn't want to do affordable, so they paid the end of it. Or maybe they have um, you know, 30 units, but still they don't want to do the affordable, so they pay the end of it. So we have had a few affordables. Carrier Woods did a couple of affordables. But for the most part, no one has responded to the RFP, and we haven't been getting our affordables in the town of Scarborough. So when this project came forward, which is 100% affordable housing, not only at 80%, but at 60% for only $10,000 per unit, um, the, the committee felt, I mean, they didn't even ask for the total amount. Uh, we upped it to $10,000 per unit in the committee because this is what we're, we're saving this money for. This is the whole purpose of those in lieu fees that some developers pay that we give to other developers to get this to get this affordable housing into the town. Um, so that that's the, how we're how we thought of it in the committee. We were saying, you know, it's uh, we've got this money. It keeps growing and growing because nobody's putting in. I should say nobody. We've had some affordables, but the majority of developers pay the in lieu fee. Um, we don't disperse the funds unless they're the projects. So last year, even though we suggested and were and were confirmed 100,000, it never got dispersed. It never went anywhere because we don't disperse unless the project approved. So one of the questions was, would we get the money back uh, if they weren't approved? But well, we don't disperse any money, so uh, they don't ever get the money. It always stays in our pocket. 
hot until everything's approved and they're moved forward uh, with state funding. And then another question was, um, you know, to describe um, the, they want to give preference to Scarborough residents. Well, you can, you can give preference if you have two equal um, people come forward for one apartment and they have everything the same and one's from Scarborough and one's not from Scarborough, you could pick the one from Scarborough. But in, in many other ways, you can't give preference um, because it would be discrimination. If you say, oh, you're from Stanford, you can't live here. I mean, you can't do that. So even though um, Bessie Commons will give preference and a lot of the people that apply are from Scarborough because they want to stay in Scarborough, they're not all. And, and because of the laws and uh, housing can't prioritize and just say we're only going to get these these places to Scarborough. So I do want to make it clear that once that once Bessie Commons two is built, it's just going to be like Bessie Commons one. People will apply for these units if they meet the, the income criteria, and, and, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it's going to go. They're not, you know, like I said, if you had two exact equal ones for one apartment, you could give preference to the Scarborough, but that's not really going to happen most of the time. Most of the time, you're going to have people come in, and you're going to have to, you know, give the apartment to the one who qualifies. Um, the other, the other question is about leaving the money there um, and letting it grow for a while. Well, we haven't even had any requests for this money except for that's common. Um, we used one hundred thousand since we started this project several years ago. For Avesta, we used 100,000. We have, I think, altogether now um, 1.2 million. And leaving it there in the hopes that someday another party would come forward, um, we have talked about how to market our RFP to try to get our developers to come here and say we want um, we want to use some of these funds and we'll put in affordable housing. But we haven't been successful. So for $10,000 per unit, we can get 40 units at an average of 60% of AMI. Uh, and we thought that was a pretty darn, darn good deal. And that's why the Housing Alliance voted unanimously uh, to bring this forward to council. So it's, it's not to let it sit there and, and wait and hope that somebody else will come forward. Um, we think this is a good use of the money that came in from developers um, for this purpose. Does anybody have any questions? Council Johnson. Could you, could you just quickly speak to the, the actual, the marketing of the RFP that you sent out this time around? Um, the, well, we didn't resend it. We just yeah. posted it on, we posted it right on the, the front page of the, um, the town website. <coughs> okay. So it's off to the right, I believe. Um, we contacted all the, the regulars, the gotcha. developers yep. that come into town, you know, that work in Scarborough Free. Um, we had, I think it was Kevin Bunker came in and talked to us about a project and, you know, some others, but they weren't looking for any money. They just were talking to us about how do you do affordable. I mean, Rocky Despair has been in, so how do you do affordable? And the problem with um, how do you do affordable questions from the developers is it has to stay affordable for like 30 years. And so they kind of find that as a roadblock if they have both market, market rate apartments and affordable apartments, and they're building on the same scale. In other words, they're they're not keeping the, the quality. It's the same exact building. Um, and then they have to maintain that 10%. Um, if one vacates, you know, it's, it's a juggling act. And so that's one reason why it's not, uh, so they've come in and asked us a lot of questions, and we've written up uh, descriptions on how to do that. We've actually, put out a spreadsheet for them. If you put in these numbers, you can kind of figure out uh, if you're going to sell a unit, how much you can sell it for, and stay marketable. Um, you know, so we've done a lot of work with them, but none of them really looking for building a mass number of affordables. Yep. They're trying to either meet their 10% or paying the in lieu fee. To follow up on that, are, are in lieu fees too low right now? Uh, yes, and we have discussed Increasing the new fee, it's twenty thousand per unit right now. We're going to go to fifty thousand. I think is the recommendation, but I don't. Know.
know that it's ever come to council yet. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. Okay. So our discussion in the committee is uh, fifty thousand. Okay. And uh, uh, Portland is a hundred thousand. So um, based on pulling it out of the air. Correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. So we're we're so we're thinking that uh, we thought fifty thousand was reasonable. We did some calculations different ways and we came up with fifty came came right in that ballpark. We did uh, several different ways we did it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just as kind of a sidebar to that, do we have to do the in lieu fees? Have you talked about not doing it at all and just requiring them to actually build out the units? Ten percent. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if it's a real struggle to get them to do it, and that's what we're learning, you know, is it better just to say that there's not that option? I mean, has that been a discussion point? Well, of the, there, there isn't an option in certain uh, zoning areas, I believe. Crossroads. Crossroads, yeah. Crossroads didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, we do, so we will get our affordable housing in, in the Crossroads um, project. But, you know, when you went to one on Highness Parkway, it's called Gateway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they were high-end yeah. condos, and, and they clearly didn't want to put affordable oh, they didn't. And, and we were willing to take their money, and they wanted to use their money, and use it for it. That's a common, because it's, it's, like I said, it not only meets our standards at, at 60%, so uh, I think at 10000 per unit, it's, it's a good deal. Uh, the uh, uh, city of Portland, uh, everyone was aghast in this affordable housing industry when they said $100,000 was the buyout cost. Yeah. And uh, having had a, a fair amount of contact with the city uh, manager and the chair of their town, city council, everybody pays the $100,000. Mm -hmm. So that tells you, and, and, the, and the reason is, it's not easy to do affordable housing development. You really need to be in that business. Uh, right. And even <clears throat> uh, at, at, at uh, Piper Shores did not want to do it. Uh, Beacon did not want to do it. The Downs has entered into <coughs> agreements with people who are in this business to do it uh, because they don't want to be in the business of doing it themselves. So it's an, it's an interesting circumstance that we've learned, do business with people who do affordable housing. And, and, that, and, that's, and that's, that's the best. Why, and that's why the housing initiatives in New England, which does Bessie Commons and Vesta, are two that are doing affordable housing solely. They're just, they're, that's what they're doing. <coughs> and so they know it. They know it inside and out. And they're not trying to juggle market rate departments with affordable mm -hmm. apartments in one complex and how do I do it if I vacate one, and then I have to keep turning down people until I get another affordable person apply? Or can I put a market person in there and then put an affordable person over here, you know, as long as I still meet my 10%? So it gets complicated. And, um, and then when they want to sell units, that's the rental market, but when they want to sell units, how much can they sell them for and still call them affordable? And that we did a spreadsheet for them so they could put in the numbers and figure that out. Um, so we're trying to help the developers uh, as much as we can, and we're trying to encourage them. But um, like Bill said, even when it goes up to 100, they still rather pay it than try to do a board. It's here. So I, my question is kind of going a, a slightly different path. I, I mean, there no, uh, nobody's questioning. Uh, you know, housing Alliance of New England, uh, Housing Initiatives of New England's uh, commitment. Uh, we went through a very thorough discussion of Bessie Commons to, you know, not more than a month ago. However, you know, to, to be following that, following that approval to be uh, looking at a, uh, another contribution, um, you, know, for, you know, four times the size of the original contribution in total and 40% of your total budget uh, for Housing Alliance. Um, it does raise a question a little bit about, well, this may be the only game in town and the only true player that's committed to low-income and senior housing. However, uh, you've highlighted in your own letter there are some you know, very serious issues you've got with profitability. You're trying to raise another $2 million in equity uh, oh, to make the project... You're saying in housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
and, and also the um, the fact that uh, uh, you know there's a shortfall uh, of about 1.8 million in funding, uh, made up of uh, comprised of additional site costs and sanitary fees and building permit fees that the developer has highlighted. So, so my question is, you know, this is a big commitment, a big decision. If this were a capital request, this would be out in front of the town for a town-wide referendum by voters. It is it technically um, taxpayer money, though? This is money we got from developers? Yep. Um, so it's, it, it's infused from another source. Right. Um, and it was, it was set up to be for the purpose of contributing right. to developers to help with affordable. Right. Um, and we did have Cindy Taylor come to the um, alliance meeting, the housing alliance meeting, um, and we're aware of all the additional costs that have come up and are still shortfall, and that is one reason why the request that she put forward for an additional 200000 we up to an additional 300000 still saying it it's still much lower than what our cap was in our RFP, which is 20000 per unit. This is only 10000 we found that it was still, um, and if she doesn't, and if the housing initiatives of New England is not successful with the state of Maine, then the money doesn't go anywhere. It's right. So, so uh, my question was, so when did they find out, do you know when housing uh, initiatives found out they, they were not approved for state funding? Last year? Uh, this was last year and now. It was but, last year. So yeah. then. Yeah, so they, have, they don't know that yet this year. But last year. But the thing, the thing I'm trying to drive at is you've identified a deficit that we try to that we want to fill by putting the housing allowance monies in that direction. And so why why didn't we cover this when we were going through it a month or so ago? Why are we why is this additional request before the council now? Is it a timing effect of, of the housing alliance? Uh, what exactly until, is the reason for that? <laughs> it's really doing a good job. I understand the public um, So there, there is a difference in, in how the, the deal was structured. Yep. And my, the, in terms of the validity of the deal, which I think is sort of your question, right? Yeah, I mean, is it going to be... Is it going to be a successful deal? Number one, and number two, the other, the question related to this is the timing effect. If you knew all these things, if you knew all these things, there were issues before us or before the housing alliance uh, four weeks ago. Then why didn't we air them then when we had a workshop? And you know why are we so doing this now? Kind of happening at the same time. So we mm -hmm. put in the application at the same at about the same time that we're also putting in the application for the tip. The tip is a requirement yeah. of the four percent. Mm -hmm. So. Say we we put in ourselves the housing alliance. Housing initiatives. No. Housing the housing initiatives. initiatives. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. And and they um, it has been mentioned to us that they would take it in many different places. They have how many places do you have? You have like twenty seven. Twenty seven different um, locations of of these kind of projects. So um, they might 
require a computer to take off kind of thing. You know, so we, we saw a need. <coughs> it just might be helpful to identify because you're with your sorry yeah. yes I'm, Hannah I'm with housing initiative okay so we're, we have two different entities after Correct. the point okay I just <laughs> just for everybody watching at home i just thought it might be helpful okay. yes Hannah, Hannah works for Cindy Taylor. Yes. yes okay yes. hannah is there a concern because the state application was rejected that the project is less attractive to your normal bin of investors that you guys go to no okay it, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily rejected it on the ground it just lost. It just yeah i'm sorry yes Yes, I got it. Right. Right. It was unsuccessful. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it seems to be going well. But there's no concern that this is this project is less attractive to your your typical investors. You bring. No. Okay. <clears throat> Do you still? I I think uh, part of the issue is that uh, the application was part of the nine percent program last year. Last year. Yeah. Uh, the four percent program is one that. Uh, Cindy Taylor told us at the Housing Alliance meeting there was a, a much higher likelihood of being able to meet the standards that are established to get the grants and funding from the uh, uh, and tax benefits from the state and the federal government that allows the investors to come in. Uh, she was specifically asked the question, will this make your uh, proposal more attractive, more likely to be able to go forward? And the answer was yes. So I think that's the, what I perceive sitting there, listening to the Housing Alliance consider how to advance this, <coughs> that they felt that the opportunity was lost last year. Uh, these opportunities don't always continue to just exist. Uh, this is a uh, long-term lease of municipal property, it's right where we want it. And so I think the, all those factors and improving the chances that this deal would be able to come together was what motivated the Housing Alliance to propose what they did. That and um, I would just add about the, the areas of people that need affordable housing are the age spectrums, the young people coming into, you know, I graduated high school here, I went to college and now I can't afford to live again, you know, those, that end, and the older people. Um, and so I, I'm sure um, Cindy Taylor uh, talked to you about the waiting list. And last I heard it was like 300 or something, and she's building 40. I don't know. 96. 96. <laughs> so, you know, but it's well above what they're even going to build. Um, so, so those two age spectrums are, are what we need to hit. So Carrier Woods did some affordables. I mean, they only did, like, I think there's six apartments over there that are affordable. But they're, you know, affordable for the younger group. And, and this would take care of 40 um, senior groups. And those are the age groups that we find need the affordable housing more. Everybody needs it to some degree. But the young ones and the old ones are really the critical mass that, that need affordable housing. And so this fit right in with what we were trying to John, did you ever? Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm fascinated by uh, the topic of available housing and affordable housing. And you know, to me, affordable is uh, it's kind of on a spectrum, right? It depends on the income that you have. And in Scarborough, and correct me if I'm misstating anything, because I'm really trying to understand it. We, um, being a relatively affluent community, not having as many residents that are at the 60% of median income, on the the nine percent point system, we have a very difficult time qualifying against uh, other projects in other parts of the state, like Sanford and whatnot, because they have more residents that are in deeper need. We have a lot of residents that would qualify. We have residents that would qualify. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the point, the the, the nine percent versus the four oh. percent, the the two credit they're, programs. They're, they're, the, the plus of the four percent. And because they released the bonds finally, so that there's money in that account. The um, the the nine percent splits its needs between senior and family, and depending on what they've decided in the QAP is a priority, points are shuffled, right? 
so it, it changes every year. And Scarborough is, uh, is not always deemed the most needy community. It is it's ranks pretty high in it, but it doesn't, we don't always win all of those points. So we kind of have to compensate by <laughs> <laughs> It, by pouring more of our own funds in to, to make the project viable, right? And, uh, and then the other question I had was, I, I know you have a number of projects and some sub subsidize the other because overall you're a nonprofit. Do you expect this project to be self-sustaining or generate a surplus or a deficit? Uh, do you have a... There they go. <laughs> Just in time. Okay. Sorry, I thought the agenda would have one longer than I am. That's not a problem. We're, we're actually taking money from what some of our other projects to put in this overall deal, but it, it is a stretch. I mean, today we got a site number that was $350,000 higher than we expected. That's just the site. So our numbers are coming in. In, in four weeks, we'll have another number for our whole building. <clears throat> I expect it to be 25% higher than our budget. Um, and then we're going to find other sources. But this $400,000 is so and I don't know if you had another question. Well, you answered that one, but then that, that's uh, part of what I'm trying to understand as well is that you, it, once you get approved for the 4% program, that you're going to be able to go out and find investors to... Um... We, no, we find the investors first. Okay. We're working with TV Bank and several other investors right now. So we're actually getting money from them. So they have restrictions on this. I mean, they will not make, allow us to go forward. So, Cindy, welcome back. I know we've, you've answered a lot of questions over the past couple of months on this project, and, uh, you know, uh, thanks for coming back. Thanks for being patient with us. I mean, nobody disputes the need. Nobody disputes the, the ability of your entity to do this. The question I got is, you know, our commitment of $400,000, you know, where does that fall in terms of your ability to get, get the, you know, investors interested in? Oh, leveraging other funds? Yeah. Huge. Yeah. So, so just shifting gears a minute, though, if we're looking at trying to make funding decisions as a town, and uh, this is an issue that's going to be in front of us, and it's only going to get bigger and gnarlier and tougher to reconcile with everything else that we're deciding on, how, how do we rank this, rank this investment of 400 k in this particular project with, with other things that are likely to, to be coming? So and we, away on this, but if I can just say to you, I'm the only one that responded to an RFP for these funds. We are an organization that is committed to affordable housing, and we have so many people looking over our shoulders that for you as a community to put this money in, you will not have to do the due, you know, due diligence annually because we have investors who have main housing. We will have so many people that will be looking at this as yeah. So, from the town standpoint, you are going to get 40 units of affordable housing. And we have, I mean, I think the last time I was in front of you, which was only a couple weeks ago, we closed our, we closed our uh, list for our marketing. And then we reopened it. We had 65 people in a week. We have up to 95 today. So the demand out there is so key. So for you as a town to think about putting money into this project right now so that we can serve the people that need it, it's not people that can wait. It's people that need it right now. So well, I'll let Marge speak to that too because she's a um, and, and again, I guess I, I can't say anything new other than what I have said. We have over a million dollars. 
Um, the developers are finding it difficult to do affordable mixed with market, which most of them are a market with 10% affordable kind of trying to throw it in. So we just keep building this fund. So we really need to work with, with developers that specialize in affordable housing, like uh, housing initiatives of New England and Avesta. Those are, those are two that just deal with affordable, and it makes it so that we can go forward and be sure that we're going to get what we, what we intended these funds for when they started coming in. Councilor Colleen, you were trying to. Uh, I, is everyone else all set? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have several thoughts and comments. There were several things that resonated with me. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about since our last meeting, um, and I think it came from that end of the table. I'm not. I think it was Bill or Jean Marie who said it, um, because I asked the question. Uh, how, you know, I was just curious. How many? What was the percentage of Scarborough residents who mm -hmm. lived there? Can I and. Yeah, well, yes, but what I want to share is my thinking and how it's evolved since then, because I, I was looking at that, in my opinion, very wrong, right? When someone moves to Scarborough, they're all our residents. And that statement, again, I'm not sh who, sure where, who it came from, but it's, but it's all of our, they're our residents here. And so we, we're not a bubble trying to keep people out. And so doing projects like this, if it attracts people from other places to come here, great, fantastic. Um, I, I recall when I first started on the council, I think there was less than $100,000 in this fund, mm -hmm. and we now have over a million. That's amazing, and we need to be using it. So um, I get that you know we want to be careful of process and mindful of things and how we're you know vetting projects and whatnot. But I, I also want to. I mean, I also know huge need that I see in our senior population, and. Um, this is going to serve that population extremely well. So I, I, I don't see any, I don't see any um, long game in saving it for a range. No, and, and not I think, agree. I think we have a great project in front of us, and, and we need to assist wherever we can with that project. And I have one more point that I really want to make, and um, this isn't necessarily pertaining to this project, but I, I hear people talk a lot, again, about um, how challenging it is and how complex it is to do inclusive models. And I, I will never, till the day I die, stop um, advocating for that. Because when you think about so many different, I, the best analogy I have is, is my own story, right? So I was a handicapped child. Um, I was not allowed to go to, uh, think about this, not allowed to go to a public school in a big city because I was going to be on crutches because teachers and the staff and the institution at that time couldn't figure out how to help me, right? And I know that's a big leap to, to say that, you know, how, how do you do this, but inclusive models of, of affordable housing can happen. They can be done. It is complex. Um, but I, I would encourage future counselors to always, especially where we have the leverage like we did in the crossroads zone or in contract zones, um, because I don't want to ever be, and it goes back to my that first resonation of thought around all of our citizens. I don't ever want to be that place that excludes, or that it's this. Oh, that's where the, the the poor senior citizens live, and this is where the wealthy uh, senior citizens live. That's not the kind of town and, and that, that I want to live in. And to that end, we have tried to write more specific rules on how to calculate it and how to figure it out, so that if you are poor, doing poor housing, you They'll get there. I believe they will get there, but yeah. they will only get there if we continue to push them. Because if we just sit back and we don't, um, the bottom line uh, profit margin will will take over, as it well, usually raising, does. Money talks. Raising <laughs> the amount of the in fee, oh, yeah. um, it was just too easy at twenty. It yeah. was just too yeah. easy, and so making it <clears throat> making it fifty, uh, hopefully it, it'll hurt just a little bit more enough that they'll maybe double think it and. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, let's vote yes. Yes, so does anybody have? <laughs> it's really it's very, very difficult. I can't tell you how difficult it is. It's more difficult today than it was when we first And I don't think it's going to get easier. Because as the Mayor said, it's going to So does anybody have any more questions for the experts that are in front of us tonight? Um, we're good? 
Thank you very much. So with that, um, that was kind of the introduction to it. Does anybody, is it, we'll open it to public comment. Does anybody have any comments on this particular issue? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Jacob? Um, any discussion, additional comments by any of us? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sorry. You were looking <laughs> at me. I was, Council Dada, I was saying. Uh, I take you guys out of school. I, th I thought there's several things that are important here. One, uh, Cindy Taylor is a Scarborough person building affordable housing in Scarborough. And this is a rare, rare circumstance. There just aren't a lot of people with this sort of expertise and skill and financial wherewithal to pull this off. Uh, the 400000 total is going to materially assist her in this renewed effort to get Betsy Commons 2 off the ground. And uh, I'm glad we advanced this to the July agenda because building costs are skyrocketing. And the faster we can allow uh, uh, Cindy to deal with the state, achieve, and the bank to, uh, to advance this, the better, and the sooner we'll have a better assurance that Bessie Commons 2 will be built, and we'll all be very proud of it as uh, citizens of the town of Scarborough. Sure. Um, I, I will say, when I look at Bessie Commons today, it doesn't look like affordable housing. I think it's um, really helped to bring back that area or this area of town and has generated economic development around it. And I think that's a big part of the reason why you do these projects. It's not just for the 40 people you're going to help, but it spurs activity around it. Um, it it's uh, it, too bad that it's taken so long uh, to complete the project. And I, I think it's a matter of the economics of doing something like this, particularly in Scarborough. So. Uh, I, I think overall, um, we need to, like Councillor um, Foley was saying, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of an inclusive model, but also think about other ways that we might be able to um, accommodate people who want to relocate to the area and, and provide for affordable housing. And I think this is one tool uh, that is necessary for us to pursue, but I'm hoping that we can think outside the box and come up with some others and maybe engage the, the business community to... Uh, really uh, take ownership. I mean, we have a, a shortage of housing and a shortage of workers, and to solve that, uh, people are going to need to get involved and, and step up and try to provide solutions to it. So I support this, um, and thank you for bringing it uh, back home. I appreciate it. <laughs> Councilor Johnson. Yeah, I, just speaking specifically to some of Councilor Hamill's concerns, um, as far as spending 40% of the budget that's currently in there, the $1.1 I think, uh, I'm looking at that more of a, it's not necessarily putting all our eggs with one player, it's, it's a per unit. And we're getting, to me this is 40 units, $10,000 a unit. It sounds like the RF, RFP was going as high as 20, so to me we're, 50, we're paying 50% at what we were willing to pay. Uh, so this isn't, to me, although 40% of the total budget might sound scary, it makes perfect sense to me. It, it's about getting the units, and the units are here. Uh, the only frustration that I would share, and I, this, is not, this is not a major point for me, it just internally, I think that there was a we did workshop about two hundred thousand, and then three hundred thousand was on the agenda. So I do I don't know where, and that was clearly in our packet. So in all fairness, it, it was right down in our packet. But I just think as a counselor, when I sat through the workshop with Cindy, we were clearly talking about two hundred thousand, and today we're talking about three hundred thousand. Totally support it, totally on board. Um, but just at, just as a a point of I can understand where some it might have caused a little bit of confusion or friction, so, but. That aside, I'm fully in support of this. Right. Committee meeting Correct. Right. And so I didn't watch the Housing Alliance meeting. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. But you're, I completely understand. Yeah. So, um, in spite of my questions, uh, I'm in favor of this. Um, but I have concerns, I, I, and they turn on this whole topic of true costs. You know, we talk about true costs for impact fees, you know, the true costs of, you know, the investments in projects like this. So it's, it's not just the 400000 you know, in total that we're going to be, uh, the housing allowance will be, housing alliance is recommended unanimously that we, that we uh, give to Bessie Commons too. I mean, I, 
it it's uh, you know it's it's uh, the dollar a year lease for 99 years. It's a TIF and a CEA we've created. It's uh, not paying taxes. Uh, it's the fact they own the building at the end of the time frame. There's there's a lot of factors in there, and I do. It does kind of, for me, raise a question. Uh, this may be the only way we can do it, and we may be blessed because we, you know, have an operator and someone who's totally devoted to that. But I I don't get a good comfortable feeling that there's enough line of sight into. Uh, you know how we fund and how the housing alliance dis, you know disseminates funding. You know this. Uh, and I tried to look back at minutes. We haven't had minutes in a while. The, the meetings are not typically um, televised. So I I just think from a process standpoint, it'd be a, a good idea for us to get a better better idea of the flow of activity. Uh, and I know this is a boom and bust business, right? Building is. Uh, you know, you, you build when the demand is there and the funding is there. But I, I would like us to give some thought to having a, you know, a little bit more line of sight to, uh, you know, how the funds are flowing so that we don't get surprised. And whether the number is 100 to 400 or 200 to 400, uh, you know, it's, it's a swing. And I, I can honestly say, and I follow this stuff pretty closely, you know, it seemed like a pretty, pretty big surprise and a sudden agenda item. But all of that said, I'm in favor of it. Anybody else? And I guess I guess where I'll weigh in too is I, I'm in favor of it tonight. But I, I think there are some good points even going around the table. And I know we've had pretty good luck as a town council doing workshops to kind of get on the same page. I sense there's some differences in thoughts about things. I think there were some rich conversations about what should we be doing about the in lieu fees. Is it is 50 enough? Is it 100? What do we want to accomplish? I think we should talk about the. Councilor Foley's is, is a great point about is there something we can do differently? Can we do it inclusively? I think that's important. So I think if it's okay with this group, I think maybe a workshop and then maybe come back and relook. So we do have that line of sight. We have some more clarity around what are our goals? What do we want to do? What's, what's the right sort of model to pursue? Um, so with that, anybody else? Final comments? So I think we've gone around. So I, we're ready to vote, I think, for all those in favor. It's unanimous. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item nine, non-action items. I don't believe there are any. Item 10 is standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. Um, I'd start at that end of the table, John. I don't know. And <laughs> sure. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, I'm not, I haven't been on any committees. I'm happy to join the communications committee. Um, yeah. Uh, effective today, so I, I look forward to that and providing an update here. But are you going to go around and do general comment as well, or are we just going to come at the very end? So um, I, I sat through a couple of committee meetings yeah. and, and uh, was able to learn a lot through the experience, so um, it was good. And I'll cover the rest during final closing. Okay, Councilor Johnson. Yeah, uh, for communication committee, we canceled the July meeting, so I really don't have much to report out on that. Um, and um, but I do know that in the future on the horizon we do have the ten thousand dollars that was alloc uh, allocated in the budget to explore some sort of survey or at least bring in perhaps a third party that might help us engage with uh, the residents more or more effectively I should say so I wish the communication council uh, committee luck on that uh, although I'm not the chair of the finance committee I would like to say uh, I appreciate you guys welcoming me aboard I do I do think the the work over the summer. That I don't foresee us voting on anything, so to speak. So I'd like to open it up, and anybody, any counselor, anybody, just come and sit. I think, in, if I'm not mistaken, it's a lot of debriefing about uh, the budget season that we just experienced. Uh, so the more the merrier when it comes to collecting thoughts on what we could do better, uh, what we did great, and what we can improve on. So um, I look forward to just being part of the deb debriefing process for the next couple of months. And uh, just kudos to Don for. Uh, you know, it's easy in the summertime to take the summer off, which by and large we have, and I'm not <laughs> complaining. Uh, but I do think that this is important work to do early. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to him that for, for taking that initiative. And I also say summertime and living is easy. No, <laughs> no meetings since our last meeting. So, um, and that's my, my fault because I did miss one conservation commission meeting um, due to a, a scheduling conflict. Um, yeah, I uh, had no formal. Uh, I'll cover in council comments okay. uh, the things that have actually been doing. Council, uh, I 
would like to thank uh, Councillor Cloutier's questions on various things. I can, I have to admit, when I read the email at first, I wasn't so happy about it. But the more I thought about it, uh, reflected on how I started in the council, and I thought that, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a good way to start questioning and uh, asking questions and trying to verify things. And I think that ends. I'm encouraged by the the way the council responded to that, and are going to try to improve on areas where uh, there are opportunities. So. I would encourage him to do that, and I think think we do a pretty good job of that as a council. So uh, keep that up. I'm, I'm quite confident that he'll be assigned plenty to do in a short order. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the other thing I'd say is that uh, on the finance committee, we uh, we are looking forward to uh, a, a joint workshop with the school board finance committee on July 24th. We're taking our regular monthly finance uh, committee meeting for the town and devoting it exclusively to that effort. So there won't be any other business items. We're just gonna debrief, we're gonna do start stops and do differently and it's purely idea generation and uh, you know we promise not to try to jump ahead to problem solving. So uh, we'll probably do that in, in August and September. But we look forward to coming back uh, probably uh, in a September time frame uh, for there to be a joint uh, workshop before a town council meeting that would have both the Board of Ed and also the, the council there, both finance committees. Um, you did and, mention it's, it's next Wednesday night at 5.30? Yeah, July 24th at 5.30 here, and uh, everyone is invited. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I've got to, I, I've got to give credit uh, to the folks uh, on the school board. You know, they do all their own work, uh, you know, they, they believer, they're really believers in process. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have discovered hanging around with teachers, actually, if you pay attention, you might learn a few things. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Great. A um, couple updates for my committees. Um, Coastal Harbor did meet. They are still tinkering a little bit with the mooring ordinance. So there should be some things coming back, some, some minor tweaks on, on some of that. Um, there was some conversation. There was a question that I have passed on to the town manager and staff about at the co-op there's a there was a new handicap ramp that went in place and there was some question about just was that appropriately placed that that was on the list um, the, the striping of the parking lot I understand is done down there and I think the rumors are that it's it's working out well good news is so far that the the, the co-op that we did have the conversations around things seem to be working out well down there kind of both in both parties are living up to their agreements um, on the shellfish committee there was some interesting conversation I'm glad to see actually it's really interesting there's going to be a joint collaborative volunteer but all the coastal communities are going to start coming together as a shellfish commission to talk about joint issues talk about the predators some of the other things, a really great example of it is our, our shellfish was really trying to change the lottery process on how our licenses are put out. They wanted, they call it the boost lottery is what they're trying to do. But they, they now have gotten documents from a sister town that has gone through the process and they're realizing starting from scratch that the legal cost and trying to change that particular thing will be difficult. They're just gonna adopt another town's language as sort of the blueprint. So they're starting to collaborate across the coastal community, which is a big plus for that, for that group. There's some new young leadership, they're doing well. Um, and the other thing they do is just a minor issue around the, the, the oyster farms just wanted to change some of their gear on the bottom, which, which the shellfish committee could, could approve. So that does it for me on updates of committees. Um, the next item is the town manager report. Um, that's me. That's, that's you, that's the rest yeah. yeah. I just want to kind of let people know about what's happening on Route 1 right out in front of Town Hall here. So that is a project that's going to be lasting through next Friday. It's a, they're laying the gas lines that are connect into the new public safety building. So they are out there from um, 7 in the morning until 5 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock at night. Um, they are keeping uh, a mindfulness towards our commuter traffic. So you will see that in the morning they will maintain two northbound lanes at all times and one southbound lane and then in the afternoon during commute hours that will reverse to be one northbound and two southbound so we are definitely trying to keep traffic flowing monday was the first day um, and unfortunate on many levels there were a number of accidents on 95 that day between exits um, between our exit and exit 45 that rerouted a lot of traffic so we had a lot of um, complaints coming that morning but uh, that's what's going on there and, and that will wrap up hopefully by next friday 
Um, also, another road project that we do hear a lot about from residents is the Gorham Road project. Right now, though, things are moving very quickly. Changes are happening daily. Um, that phase one of that project, they expect to wrap up by mid-August. So people should be really seeing some significant changes there and, and, and hopefully feeling that their, um, their stress caused on that commute has been worth that. <coughs> uh, quick update on the residential revaluation. So our um, firm that we've hired for that KRT, they have finished all of the callbacks. That process is now complete, and we have KRT representatives out in the field. If you still see their vehicles driving around, they're simply doing a field review um, that they will complete in the next week or so. Value notification letters will be heading out to residents on, at the beginning of August, so residents should be looking for those in their, their mail. That will let them know what their previous town assessed value was, what the new assessed value for their home is. There will also be instructions in there about how they can come and speak to representatives from KRT if they disagree with that value. And so that process will be set up and those meetings, those hearings is what we actually call them, for valuation concerns will take place through mid-August. But we are on track to wrap up this project and be ready to commit taxes by the end of August per usual. Um, so a big, huge shout out to our assessing staff. They are a team of three and um, a bit. We have a, a part-time person that comes in and they are just they are just hitting out of the park. They're doing a great job. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, I just want to have a quick question. Do you have a date yet for those KRT hearings? I'm just thinking it's summer, it's August. Like we don't have a set date um, because we we don't know for sure when the letters are going to go out and we want to make sure we have enough time. But it will be within, we will have multiple nights and days available so that people's schedules can be accommodated. It will take place over a two-week period okay. so that if people are gone for a week on vacation, there still will be another opportunity that was for one them of my to come in. So yep, we want to be really sensitive to people's schedules. We know it's summertime and it's not ideal. But in some ways, summertime is ideal because we want to make sure that those seasonal residents that are here with us only during these great months also have an opportunity to meet with representatives from KRT to express their concerns. Thank you. So, um, and then there, just as kind of a public announcement, if you meet with KRT and there isn't a resolution to be had there, residents do have another, um, another grievance process to be had. Once tax bills have gone out, residents may seek an abatement. And so there's, that is always a resident's op, uh, um, right to be asking for that abatement through our assessing office. So the KRT hearings are to meet with the um, assessing contractors to talk about what they saw and what's on their property card versus what the reality may be in that home. Um, but then if there's still not resolution there, residents still have another uh, space for recourse, which is through the abatement process. So stay tuned. We've got a long fall and winter kind of coming up ahead of us, but really super impressed with our team that we've got downstairs. If you've got a moment to stop in and just smile at them kindly, that would be nice of you in the next month. Um, and then finally, speaking of departments that are just hitting things out of the park, uh, I hope that people have seen these posters hanging about. about. It's also on Facebook um, and on the uh, Community Services Instagram account. So it is Parks and Rec Month um, across the country, and our Community Services team are just always amazing. It's one of my favorite spaces to spend some time. They're just great people. And they have come up with a whole calendar through the month of July to encourage people to get out in our public spaces, mm -hmm. to get out and try new things. Um, some of them are a bit tongue in cheek, like Shred the Gnar at the Scarborough Skate Park. Um, and some of them are a little bit more perhaps accessible to everyone's um, mental space, uh, just visiting the Audubon Center on the Marsh. So just really encouraging people to get out. But then above and beyond that, they've set up um, four special events at Memorial Park that are free and open to the public. Tonight was supposed to be one of them, but the weather forecast pushed that off until next Tuesday. Um, the 23rd at 6, uh, 4.30 p.m., game on in the park, and we'll have pickleball stuff out there and cornhole and volleyball and lots of great activities to bring your family to and yourselves to and enjoy. And then yoga in the park on the 24th, and that will all wrap up with back to basics workout on the 29th. So please come join our community services staff and celebrate the good work that they're doing. All right. Um, item 12 on the agenda, <coughs> council member comments, and I'll start down with Council Hamill. Yeah. Uh, I, the pace is decidedly slower in the summer, and I think that's a, a welcome change. Mm -hmm. uh, um, at the same time, I think there's uh, an opportunity to get a few things done, and I'm you know, looking forward to going to a uh, uh, marijuana symposium, I think, on the 21st. <laughs> yeah. you know, looking forward to that. Uh, and a few other things, so we referenced the finance activity. So there's still, you know, a couple things for us to kind of knock out of the way and uh, still get in some golf and tennis, so <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, it may look like it's quiet uh, uh, for in many respects, but uh, 
there's a tax exemption lawsuit by public uh, by uh, Piper Shores that uh, Tom Hall, the town manager, and I have worked with our lawyers extensively in recent months. Uh, they are complicated legal issues. There is a lot of money at stake. Uh, and uh, we have a plan, and we are executing it. Uh, I'll probably be able to report more uh, as we proceed, but it's, uh, it's very active uh, at the present time. But I'm confident about where we are and the, the position we've maintained. Uh, people have been asking, uh, uh, what can the region do to help with the asylum seeker emergency that uh, has occurred? Um, Tom Hall and I regularly attend the Metro Regional Coalition meeting. I chair it, I've been chairing it the last couple of years, I think almost by default. Uh, uh, they have a really exceptional executive director by the name of Christina Egan from, uh, from Freeport. Uh, and when this crisis occurred, the emergency occurred, Tom and I talked and we decided that uh, rather than leaving it solely to the city of Portland to try and figure this out, that since the Metro Regional Coalition represented the seven communities that surround and make up Greater Portland, that this would be a great organization because they have a great leader. Uh, and so we went to Christina Egan and asked her if the, uh, she would entertain this as a project, and she embraced it. And um, we immediately held an emergency meeting. Uh, all of the Metro Regional Coalition communities, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Gorham, Westbrook, Cape, South Portland, Scarborough, all attended, uh, all to get marching orders on what we can do. Uh, and we started looking for affordable, uh, for uh, housing, uh, temporary housing. Uh, and that has been one of the uh, key steps that the city of Portland has asked us to do because they have to get uh, the uh, 100, 200 uh, odd people out of the expo by early mid August. And so that's been, uh, that has been advancing. And uh, the Metro Regional Coalition, this is the Greater Portland Council of Governments, has really taken on a leadership role, been very proud of, of the way they have turned to with their staff. Uh, it turned out that uh, uh, as this project went forward, we were look, talking about where can we find temporary housing. John Cloutier uh, suggested that he uh, talk with uh, Christina Egan, uh, which he has done so. Uh, their, John's interest comes from the fact that he owns a hotel that is a seasonal hotel in the, the town of Old Orchard Beach. And seasonal housing was perceived as something that if we can get people into um, uh, families' homes for a month or two or three and then do seasonal housing starting in the fall when all of these facilities, whether it's Saco or Old Orchard Beach, or Scarborough, uh, they all close up, hundreds of them close up. So that's, that's been an, the initiative that's been going forward and it's, uh, I was very pleased to play a small part of uh, organizing that. Um, uh, Edge Sports and Scarborough Downs uh, are advancing their analysis of the need for sports facilities at Scarborough Downs. A number of counselors uh, John, Paul uh, uh, Johnson, uh, uh, Katie, uh, and I have been very interested and involved with it. Uh, the Scarborough Downs and Edge people have advised the town that by next week they're going to be ready to come back and talk in more detail as to what they envision the scope might be and what our role might be, and then we'll go from there. Uh, so. Uh, this project is alive and well behind the scenes. It's a big deal because it would advance the downtown portion of the project from the seven to eight year horizon that was expected to something dramatically sooner. So uh, kind of exciting. I find that to be very exciting news. And we'll report more on Scarborough Downs uh, in, the, in the next month. They're back in front of the planning board for their industrial zone permit uh, approvals, and uh, it seems as if everything's going very well. There. Thank you.
Councillor Pullen? Uh, yeah, I do have a few things actually. So, record number of uh, fledgling plovers uh, this year, 27, I believe, was in the last report um, across our beaches. So, job well done by all the monitors and, and folks uh, being mindful of the cute little guys down there at the beach. Um, it, it seems like we just got here. Right? We, it was January, February, then March, 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 March. And then now it's mid-July, and uh, it's going to be so summer fest. It's right around the corner, and I can't remember the date, but I want to throw that out there because we only have one meeting in August. August 16th. There you go, and that's mm -hmm. so before we even meet again, um, August 16th, summer fest. Come check it out. Uh, also, one, I'm glad you gave a shout out to the Parks and Rec. I did drive by and saw over 60 people that look appeared to be participating in a Zumba class out in the park, which uh, looked to be having great fun. And then um, last but not least, I wanted to mention, because again, we blink and, and time goes by, but there will be two council seats uh, open this fall. Um, I will not be seeking re-election. And um, so those papers come out again before we meet again. So those would be available for you. Tony just told me August. First Wednesday. First Wednesday, August, first Wednesday in August, August 7th. So, and how many days do they have to turn those back in? They have to have them back by first uh, Wednesday in September. Right, so like August, so it's like 30 days. And so it does sneak up on you, it comes fast. and. Um, so those, I would say, uh, you know, if you've had an interest, call any one of us. We'd be happy to talk about it. Um, you should absolutely do it. If you learn a lot, your eyes get open to a lot of things. You meet some amazing and great people. Um, and I'm very glad I did it. I'm going to be very glad to um, step back and focus on my family. So um, there you go. Have a great evening. So uh, I just have three quick things. Number one, I was wise enough to go to Pine Point Beach on July 4th. Uh, <laughs> however, with that being said, I did get a, uh, I asked for and received a very thorough tour of the, uh, with the police officer that was on duty, uh, which was uh, very informative for me. Uh, there were, I believe there were somewhere between seven and nine tickets that were on windshields of people that were parking in the dirt parking lot in the co-op yeah. that were not supposed to be. Uh, so it was very encouraging to take that tour. Um, it seems like the feedback's been uh, fantastic all the way around, and it looks like the enforcement, the presence there is, is very obvious. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, while I was on the beach, which was, the, I, we go to the secret beach, the little beach where the co-op is, and many people... It's not secret anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, many people around me were talking about all the upped enforcement. They didn't know where it came from, so I just pretended like I didn't know anything. Um, <laughs> Secondly, uh, this is uh, to change perhaps Councillor Foley's idea of not running again. Uh, I believe there might be a discussion worth having about dogs in Memorial Park. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. I'll speak to you from that side of the podium, don't you worry. <laughs> just thought I'd float it out there. I just wanted to create a little bit of awareness that I believe uh, because Memorial Park is incredibly beautiful and, and finally being utilized more and more, I, I, I foresee that we have we have some uh, sorting out to do about what uh, what is appropriate uh, dog mm -hmm. usage at Memorial Park. So Katie, maybe second second, you know, think those papers you don't want to take out. <laughs> um, and then lastly, uh, the community center, the downtown committees. I, I believe we were charged to form those by September, if I'm not mistaken. And I know Tom had mentioned it about two or three months back, and I know we have some exciting fact-finding still going on with the Edge Sports Complex, but I did want to say it publicly that I believe that we have some sort of responsibility to address the fact that these committees were, uh, were to be formed by September according to the CEA agreement. I think I have my facts right on that. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have a few things this month. I uh, was able to, kind of not being in a lot of committees, sit in on a lot of committee meetings and uh, meet with staff. Uh, I was able to sit down with Kara Martin from SEDCO and learn more about um, what she does and, and her group does uh, to help small businesses, um, which I was really encouraged by. It's something that, as a small business owner, I certainly could have um, utilized uh, about 10 years ago. Um, you, you kind of get bogged down. It's overwhelming because you don't have a big staff to, to do stuff when you're running a small business. Um, so they have a lot of um, techniques to get you thinking about things that you may not have thought about when you're thinking about um, going into business. And then they also get involved when, when larger companies want to come to town as well. So uh, 
I, 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 I learned a lot from the meeting. I, I met with Chief Thurlow from the fire department and got a tour of that building. Um, found a number of fire code issues, but he acknowledged them. And, um, so we're, we're, we're glad that the, the new building is, is being built. Um, also met with Nancy Crawl from the, the library, um, took a tour there, and uh, was able to understand some of their pain points a little bit better as well. And, and a lot of the history, um, which there's a lot of um, history with the library in multiple locations, um, I was able to sit down with Chairman Hayes. Uh, and as it turns out, we, we actually have some um, uh, Factors in common, I uh, used to have a camp up in Auburn, and it was a long-standing five-generation uh, family business that was there that I was a frequent customer of, so mm -hmm. I know his, his family um, reasonably well. Small, small world. It, it really is. It really is. Um, so I, I did have a couple of constituent calls that I'm going to track down um, with town staff. Um, I'd like to congratulate Scarborough Softball for being uh, selected as the Press Herald's varsity uh, main girls team of the year. Um, they completed their third consecutive undefeated season, which is simply uh, mind-blowing. Um, they won the state tile, the title for the, the third year in a row um, and have won 60 games in a row. Uh, I, I wanted to comment a little bit on the, the housing theme from, from this week. Um, and to me, it's not just uh, affordable housing, it's housing in general. And I think if, as housing becomes more available, then the affordability piece um, starts to be, be solved. There, there's a shortage of housing in this region, and there's a shortage of workers in this region. I, I feel it um, very strongly as a, as a business owner. Um, we need a, a highly inefficient, multi-pronged approach to try to bring workers to the area uh, for the summer for me, but also year round, it's, it's a struggle. Not a lot of people want to move to Maine that are of working age. And um, I, I said this earlier, but I'd like to challenge some of my fellow business owners to be a part of the solution for this problem and to find creative housing solutions um, that, that can help bridge the gap between where we are now and where we need to be based on uh, the demand for workers. Um, and a couple of stats that, that I looked at. Um, is our, or one really, is our senior ratio, which measures the, uh, the proportion of working age residents or people to seniors. And it, it's an interesting statistic uh, that's been changing over time and we expect it to continue to change. Um, in Maine, the ratio in 2017 was uh, 3.2. So it's 3.2 working age um, residents to every senior. Um, in 2032, we expect it to be closer to two, more like 2.1. Um, that's a dramatic shift. Uh, on top of that, Maine is, uh, uh, has a very low ratio relative to the rest of the nation. The national average is four and a half. Um, in 1950, it was almost eight. So there, that's really going to create some issues for um, us locally as well. In Scarborough, our ratio is 2.4. Um, so we, uh, we're going to watch that, or I'm going to watch that as it goes. But I, I think, for me, it really underscores the need to bring workers to the area here. Um, it, it, it's going to be critically important in the coming five to ten years. So, thank you. You're welcome. And I guess with that, um, wish, wish everybody the, the happy summer, or hopefully the nice weather continues, and we will see everybody in August. Um, with that, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you, everyone.